So now we continue with the part three of the talk. So we're up to the liturgy of the word. The liturgy of the, uh, of the introductory rites finishes with the, uh, the, final, the opening prayer. The liturgy of the word begins and we all sit down and we begin with the first reading. The reader comes and in the reading of the mass uh, at the liturgy of the word, the reading always, the proclamation, of, it's meant to be a proclamation of God's word. And the first reading from the Old Testament is usually, or else it could be from the Acts of the Apostles, or sometimes, pretty rarely, from the, uh, from the book of Revelation or the Apocalypse. But generally it's from the Old Testament. One of the things that had to happen, you know, how did the church actually come to this arrangement? The second reading is from the Psalm, then the, the, the sorry, following that first reading, then there's an actual second reading from the New Testament, and then there's the gospel. How did the church actually come to this understanding of her liturgy in terms of how she uses scripture? Well, when the resurrection of Christ from the dead took place, and then over 40 days, Jesus appears to the disciples to reassure them that he is alive, to say, Can't you, now do you see the different connections, the different things that I have uh, told you about and so forth and then eventually with the coming of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit reminds them of all that Jesus had taught them <clears throat> they had a huge reconstruction job to do the early church and what do I mean by that reconstruction job I mean that now they had to look on all that had gone before them in the Old Testament so the books of Moses the law so the five first books of the Old Testament and then the prophets and then the Psalms, and to understand them now in light of Christ, not in light of the Mosaic law, which means now they had to see how the scriptures were in fact fulfilled in Jesus Christ. This is why I think it's uh, St. Athanasius, um, although don't quote me on this one, St. Athanasius <coughs> who said that the the Old Testament is fulfilled in the New, and the New Testament is contained in the Old. That is what actually happens. Now, when you think back, so they had to rethink all the different things that happened now in the Old Testament as somehow pointing the way to Jesus Christ. And we see this very symbolically and very importantly at the Easter Vigil, when we come into a darkened church and then, you know, we're supposed to turn the lights on before the liturgy of the word, we have the, the exalted, and then we have all those readings. Those readings have a purpose, and the readings are reading a psalm and a prayer to help turn our minds to or reinforce what we've just learned. What we do in those seven readings, and I hope if you haven't experienced the liturgy of the, the Easter Vigil, with the whole seven readings of the Old Testament and then the reading from the New and then the Gospel. I hope if you haven't experienced such a liturgy that you will one day experience it, and not once but even several times. Mm -hmm. And I love it when the church is actually kept in darkness, even though the rubrics say you're supposed to turn the lights on. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you read the readings in the Old Testament in the dark, and the Paschal candle is right next to the lectern, the Paschal candle means Christ in the Easter Vigil, lit from the new fire. And you know, the, um, the light of Christ, thanks be to God. And then that light of Christ is placed next to the lectern. And now we read all these Old Testament readings, but in the light of Christ. Good. So we are looking now at all those things that the Jewish people had read and pondered over. But we are seeing them with different glasses now, the Christological glasses. And we're looking and think, ah, oh. so the creation of the world was ultimately foreseeing the coming of Christ. Oh, okay. And then the fall. In the Genesis, you cannot leave that reading out. There's options where you can leave various readings out. You can't leave that one about the creation of the world. And then also uh, the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the scene. And so I think, uh, is that also one of the readings, the fall, I think the, uh, but then there's Exodus, which you also can't leave out, 
I think there's two from Genesis. If I, no, sorry, there's one at Abraham. That one is also important because it talks about the sacrificial nature of the future Christ. You talk about the Exodus passing through the Red Sea and baptism and all of that. So they had to do a whole retake, so to speak. This has now passed on into the life of the church. So what you find in the liturgy of the word is, and this happened from the beginning, you find this typology. The scripture in the Old Testament and then the New. So you'll find in the first reading typically some theme that is also paralleling what's happening in the gospel. The gospel is the high point of the liturgy of the word and it is what sets the tone for each week, each Sunday, in whichever season. And then the first reading parallels what is going on there. This does not take place in the, in the weekday cycles, where you have cycle year one or year two, depending on odd or even. But then on the Sunday, you've got the cycle of three, A, B, or C, corresponding to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Whereas John, John, we read him plenty of times in other passages, you know, coming up in Christmas, and then, of course, Lent, and, and then in Easter, and on the Christmas feast as well, Christmas season. So, what we have happening there is that there's this parallel. So, we see how in the Old Testament, there was actually a preparation for Christ. And the early Christians did this, and for centuries did this. So that's why you'll find when you read the first reading from the scriptures, you will find the parallel in, on Sundays, you'll find the parallel of it in the gospel. Sometimes it's not so clear cut. Okay, sometimes it's not so clear cut. So for instance, last Sunday, the first reading talked about wisdom and the creation of wisdom and how wonderful wisdom is. And, how because of wisdom we're able to see the world and, and all of that and God's will comes on this earth and, and his will is brought into fulfillment. The gospel? What was the gospel about last Sunday? Jesus was heading on the way to Jerusalem and on his way to Jerusalem he stopped and turned around with large crowds. Now, Unless you hate your mother, father, son, da, 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 da. whoa, 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 we're coming with you to Jerusalem, you know, strong words, fighting words, and then it goes into launch on the cross. Where's the parallel? It doesn't look like there's an obvious one, but in fact there is. It's a different wisdom. There's the wisdom that we initially take for granted about God's wisdom being shown resplendent in creation. Jesus, the Word of God incarnate, is showing us the wisdom of the cross. Not a, a favorable wisdom that we would like to hear necessarily, but it's the wisdom of the cross. Ah, this is the true wisdom. The wisdom that will in fact set us free. And it is a wisdom, the teaching of the cross. But it's a little bit more subtle. The previous week, I can't remember the readings exactly now, but there was a similar thing as well going on. So, but most of the time, the parallel is much more immediate, you know, that we see. So in the reading, now if you're hearing the prophet Isaiah, if you're hearing from the book of Genesis, if you're reading from the book of Joshua or Judges or whatever it is in that first reading, then it's Isaiah who is speaking to you speaking through the reader, using his or her voice, using their mannerisms, using all of that. So those of you who are readers, and then I want you really to see how privileged your role is. You are not just reading to those people in front of you. <coughs> you are. But when you are present at the Mass, in every celebration of the Mass, the entire church is mystically present mystically in mystery even i've celebrated mass many times on my own for necessity the whole church is present and the whole church is who people, people. Mm -hmm. keep going people. lots of people yep this i we we all agree so oh. keep going keep going mm -hmm. communion, of communion of saints okay which includes who God. 
<laughs> help me, help me, come on. Includes God for sure. So, first of all, let the living and the dead. Okay, now in the dead, who, the dead who are saved, are all living. True? Yeah. 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 Who are the dead? So the, the souls, in purgatory. souls in purgatory, one group, and, and those in heaven. Excellent. So the church is in three states. Those on this earth, those in purgatory, those who have died. God forbid if any souls are in hell lost, they are no longer part of the church. The image of God within them, St. John of the Cross, still remains there. And the mark of the spiritual character of baptism and uh, of, um, of confirmation and God forbid any priests who are there or bishops, those characters are also there as well, but uh, would be there. However, they are outside of the church at that moment. Uh, and so there's three phases. So it, it not only has the immediate community visibly in front of you, but then it's all the church, all the believers on this earth, and then in, in purgatory and in heaven. So that's, the whole church is mystically present. Then you've got a... Uh, so when you're reading, obviously you're proclaiming the word immediately to those in front of you who are hearing, because we were just finished saying that the liturgy actually is using our senses and all of that to transmit and communicate the Paschal mystery. We're also, so keep, keep that in mind that, you know, if it's St. Paul who is, um, that we're reading his readings, then St. Paul is speaking and St. Paul is using you. So therefore a reader should be prepared for what they're reading. And sometimes, you know, it's not half obvious that a reader has not prepared the reading. Uh, no, no. Okay? And, and sometimes it's true, like, maybe even the priest hasn't really prepared the reading very well. But we're going to get to that as well in a minute. <laughs> so that's the reading. Once then the reading has been proclaimed, the idea is that it's a proclamation. So, yes, it's read, but it's a proclamation. Now, why am I making the distinction? Because a reading read well... Well, let me just read something to you, and then I will proclaim it to you. The Holy Eucharist completes Christian initiation. Those who have been raised to the dignity of the royal priesthood by baptism and configured more deeply to Christ by confirmation participate with the whole community in the Lord's own sacrifice by means of the Eucharist. So I've read it. I've read it with sense. You've gotten the idea. But a proclamation would be more like this. The Holy Eucharist completes Christian initiation. Those who have been raised to the dignity of the royal priesthood by baptism are configured more and configured more deeply to Christ by confirmation participate with the whole community in the Lord's own sacrifice by means of the Eucharist. Can you see the difference? One, I'm trying to actually engage you. I'm trying to make this word come alive so that you are engaged with it. Now, sometimes people will have missal, and that's good, I have nothing against missals, but when a reading is read in a proclamatory way, it almost wants to make you put down your missile, and now you're listening, you're really engaged. Whereas you can have a reading that is not proclaimed very well, and then kind of puts you to sleep, or you say, thank God I have the missile, because I can scarcely understand what they're saying, you know? And, maybe, and some readers should not be reading. So it's, it's not just, uh, oh, everybody who puts their hands up should be reading for reading, should be reading. Okay, we'll find another job for them to do, but it's not a ministry for everyone. And then when we do that, when, when that becomes the criterion, we in fact do more harm to the overall liturgy than enhance it. So, after the reading has been proclaimed, then we move to the psalm. And the psalm is, so now the word of God has gone out. And it requires a response. And that response is going to be the very word of God. That response is the psalm, and the church has done this for centuries. The one thing, though, that should never, ever, 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 ever happen with the liturgy of the word, excuse me, is that it's replaced by, the word of God is replaced by something else. 
and I've seen in some cases I remember a wedding uh, I was in a parish and a, a priest a visiting priest came to celebrate a wedding there and reading number one mm -hmm. was from mm -hmm. Carl Gibran and I'm thinking <laughs> it was an Eastern philosopher and I thought mate nice a bit quacky on some things but I'm thinking this is no replacement for the Word of God he thought he was being cool and whatever giving the couple the chance to you know have some reading I'm thinking you do not have the faith on what the sacred Word of God is all about Jesus Christ says heaven and earth will pass away but my words will not pass away it's the word that is inspired by the Holy Spirit who will lead you into the path of all truth that is the word that will not pass away that is the word that will nourish you not the words of philosophers or teachers or whoever they may be helpful in other contexts but they are no replacement for my word so then we respond to the word of god by the word of god which is the psalm then the church gives us <coughs> course number two and so now we've moved from the old testament we've moved into the new testament and we and there's not meant to be a connection between the new testament and the gospel as well sometimes there is but oftentimes there isn't but there's something else for us to chew on so usually by the time we take the three or four readings if you count the psalm as a reading you end up having an absolute banquet of things to chew on in the liturgy and then you we move to the gospel and in the gospel we have you know the alleluia verse if there's incense used incense is brought out we have the Alleluia verse is meant to be sung. If it's not sung, then it can even be left out, although it's, uh, it can also be said. So there's different options now. As I said, we stand up for the gospel. We have candles, if candles are also being used. Why do we stand up for the gospel? Because now it's Christ who is speaking to us. And just as we would for any important guest, we stand up for him. And then even other acts of veneration are engaged when we are listening to the gospel. The gospels proclaim, the Lord be with you and with your spirit. And by the way, there shouldn't be an opening of the hands. That was never part of the liturgy. You'll see some priests do it, but they just forget because they're into, in the habit of doing it for the opening greetings or the Eucharistic prayer. But at the gospel, the priest should not open his hands. The Lord be with you is just verbal and with your spirit a reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark, Matthew Mark Luke or John then we trace the cross now for his lips and hearts again opening mind and it's always the cross through the name of Christ opening my mind to understand his word my lips to proclaim it my heart to love it and then the priest or deacon proclaims the gospel and then at the end the gospel of the Lord praise to you Lord Jesus Christ some will pick up the book and say the gospel of the Lord that is not the gospel of the Lord it's the printed gospel of the Lord the gospel of the Lord is actually the proclaimed word that is the gospel of the Lord what I have just proclaimed to you the gospel of the Lord then he's meant to pick up and kiss the book afterwards so the, again the kiss is a sacred veneration uh, that we attribute to the printed text again in honor and respect for Christ the uh, and then uh, a custom that has come into the Latin Rite from the Eastern Rites is that whenever it's a solemn mass pontifical mass which means there's a bishop present then and there is a special book of the Gospels then that book of the Gospels which may be brought in then in procession that book of the Gospels is taken by the deacon or by the priest in the absence of a deacon, taken to the bishop, and he kisses the word, the Gospel. Why? Because the bishop is the one, when he's presiding, even though he's not reading the Gospel, but he presides over the liturgy of the word. He then kisses the Gospel, and then he may give a blessing with the book of the Gospels. So, and then we would bless ourselves at that moment just as we would if we are sprinkled with holy water. And when we bless ourselves, <coughs> Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Trinity, okay, it just keeps coming again and again and again. Without the Trinity, there's no life, there's no nothing. We are vanished, we cease to exist. 
Then the gospel, we sit down. So that's the high point of the gospel. Then comes the homily. And then the homily is meant to be an extension of the liturgy of the word. The liturgy of the word comes to its conclusion at the end of the prayers of the faithful. So then comes the creed and then the prayers of the faithful. <clears throat> now, with the liturgy of the with the uh, homily, what is the homily meant to be? The homily is meant to be an exhortation of the congregation to an, a challenging and an admonition to live up to the lessons that have just been heard in the scriptures. And the let me just, uh, if I could find it, I can't find it now, but I, it, it actually says about the, it, it talks about admonition and exhortation of the congregation. So the idea is that it's not meant to be a, a feel-good session. Some homilies you think, oh my goodness, it's just syrupy and whatever, it said nothing to me. Or it's just a simple repetition of the gospel. It's meant to be a breaking open of the word of God. It's meant to be an exhortation. How are you, my brothers and sisters, together with me, how are we going to live out these lessons? So, some criteria that you have a right to expect from a homily. Number one, that the homily, <coughs> excuse me, is prepared one again sometimes it's a sacred ministry of preaching there's a duty incumbent upon priests deacons and bishops to prepare their homilies as well as they can some are more gifted than others okay say la vie but you know when there are when the homily is prepared or when it is not and now there are so many resources available with printing and internet and so forth that even if there's no idea comes to you as a result of your prayer life then at least you can get someone else's homily and use it and use the material and so forth right so the homily <coughs> criterion number one is that it's to be prepared two that the homily is delivered in a way that is not offensive and that is polite now what do i mean by that it means that it's spoken in good, proper English, Swahili, Maltese, German, whatever it happens to be the language of the people, but it's meant to be, so, it's, so that's how it's meant to be delivered in a courteous way, not vulgar language or anything like that. But it's meant to challenge. And this then leads me to the third <coughs> part, that it's about Christ. The homily is meant to be about the mystery of Christ who will both challenge us and soothe us. Today's feast of St. John Chrysostom. St. John Chrysostom is a Greek name for him, meaning golden mouth. Chrysos stomos, stoma, stomatos. But, uh, so golden mouth, and because he was so eloquent, a great doctor of the church, he was bishop somewhere, and then he became archbishop, I think it was Constantinople. So very, very famous. C, patriarchal C. Well, there was a queen in the court and he was preaching to her and so forth and she didn't like what he had to say so it was, became uncomfortable for her because, you know, the gospel niggles us and makes us uncomfortable. And so eventually she, she and her own collaborators found an excuse, how are we going to get rid of this guy? And they, the Council of Nicaea had happened some time before in 325 and one of the teachings from the Council of Nicaea was that bishops shouldn't be moved around from one diocese to another because there's supposed to be like a marital relationship between the bishop and the local church. You know, that the bishop marries the church. And, uh, and even though in the Eastern, um, Eastern Catholic rites, priests could, uh, at least some priests, could marry and even in some West Latin um, sort of rites, in the uh, Latin rites, I'm not sure if there's any Western rites where the priest could marry. Nevertheless, so Maronites, Melkites, the priest can marry. Nevertheless, the bishops, as the fullness of the priesthood, were only ever chosen from the monks. So they never, uh, in fact, married. 
And so be that as it may, and then they use that against him to get rid of him from that diocese and he had to go back to the other diocese. So he's very humiliated, but he bore it with great patience and resolve and abandonment to God. And he you know, was a, was a great uh, doctor and saint of his time. The, uh, the point is I'm making is that Christ, when we preach him fully, then he comforts the disturbed and disturbs the comfortable, which is a enough, nice rule of thumb for a good homily. It comforts the disturbed and disturbs the comfortable. And so they're the three, my three criteria for a, a homily. It should be prepared. Two, it should be delivered in a way that's polite and, and so forth, not, not rude in, in some way. But it's always got to be about Christ, which means it's not about politics or the social <laughs> issues of the day or anything else or some other agenda. If those agenda touch on the teachings of Christ, then fair enough, speak to them. It, we need the priest or the deacon needs to be able to connect what's going on in the readings or in the liturgy uh, with what's happening in people's lives. Also, in terms of the content, what it means by Christ, it's got to be about Christ, it doesn't mean just about the gospel, nor even just about the readings, although most of the time the homily will pick up some thread from that. In fact, the homily may be from anything about, about the liturgy of that day. Okay, so you might preach uh, whatever, a homily about the entrance antiphon, or the communion antiphon may be a very powerful statement. So the priest decides to preach on that day. Or the psalm. How, how often have you heard of, well, that's the liturgy of the word already, um, but it might be the prayer over the gifts, for example, or the opening prayer. Um, so all of these can form the content of the homily. Question. Well, just to go back to Mar Mar priests get married. Yes. Uh, do you think we'll get to the stage where the priests will be allowed to marry? What I think is actually irrelevant. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, I, uh, I don't know. I mean, that could in theory happen, I, uh, I mean, the fact is they can be married now. So, to me, when some propose it as a as an obstacle to vocations to the priesthood and so forth, they're really missing the point. Because I could go and before being ordained a priest, say become a Maronite priest mm -hmm. and get married if I felt drawn to the priesthood and and at the same time drawn to marriage as well and get married and be a priest. The other thing that's often overlooked in this whole idea about priests getting married is once the wife dies, if she dies before him, he is not allowed to marry again. This is an ancient custom. Also, uh, when you look at what's happened in the uh, Anglican communion and Protestants and so forth, who have been marrying for decades, uh, centuries, they have a shortage of priests and ministers. They're not Catholic priests, obviously. The, the, the line of the, the doctrinal line of the Sacrament of Holy Orders has been broken with the Reformation. But they also have a shortage of clergy. So it's not about that at all. It's a very flimsy kind of uh, knee jerk kind of reaction. So I think, I mean, but the, it's still a discipline. It became an official discipline in the West in the 11th century, but it actually goes back to apostolic origins. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we don't have time to sort of um, uh, to go into it, but the definitive book is, um, I think its surname is um, um, Concini, someone, C-O-N-C-I-N-I. And anyway, he just traces it back to the origins of apostolic celibacy as coming from the time of the apostles. Uh, even early on, the Holy Spirit made it very clear that the ones who are going to be leading his community would, would be the ones who also choose celibacy. And another little thing that is sometimes you hear priests, particularly in the Latin rite, saying that celibacy was forced on them. Just challenge them when you hear that, say, because it's actually a lie. Mm. They embrace it freely. I, no one forced my hand to be celibate. And even if I, the, the law, the discipline changed, I would not marry. Uh, just not only in the sense that my heart is given to, to God in that way, but for my availability to the service of God's people. But also, if I had a wife and children, I mean, I'm nearly 50, but the fact if I had a wife and children, you know what? And I'm having meetings with different people three or four nights a week. 
you know what, my wife and children are probably going to start complaining. But also, I'm counseling some woman and spiritual direction. You know what, my wife would be a human being. Is she not going to worry? I think, okay, uh, you know, Mark, I know you're, you're pretty close to this particular woman. You can read between the lines, right? Jealousies and all that. So there's a practical dimension as well. So just challenge them on it because I think they, yeah, anyway, they, they, they try to make it look like they're the victims. They're not. What they're really saying is, I didn't want celibacy, but I thought I was called to the priesthood. And the church has said to them, sorry, in the Latin rite, if you're called to the priesthood, you're also called to celibacy. This has been the revelation or the, not revelation, the decision of the church and the discernment of the church. And you have embraced both of them. And if you haven't done so, if that uprightness of heart, then the rethinking is on your side, not on the side of the church. So, but yeah, thanks for asking that the question. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, just going back to the Bishop Crystal Golden Mouth. Yes. Um, St. John wasn't Chrysostom. He, mm. Was he not a monk or was he married? Which one he caused was, them to get rid of him? Oh, he was. Uh, no, he was a monk. Yeah, one of the oh, what's known as the <coughs> Cappadocian Fathers. The reason they got rid of him is because he was the chaplain, and I, I think it was con in Constantinople, he was a chaplain uh, for, I think, one of the queens at the time in the imperial court. She didn't like his preaching yeah. because he was okay. exposed. So, but what was the reason? Oh, sorry, the reason they got rid of him was that um, in the Council of Nicaea, it said a bishop shouldn't be moved around from one diocese to another. Right. He had already moved from the diocese oh. of wherever he was to an archdiocese oh. in Constantinople because he was so gifted and, and capable. Yeah. And so then he went back to his original diocese. Oh. I imagine those people loved him to return. That would have been a great loss right. to them. So he just he continued his work. Oh yeah, he continued he his work. he just went back to the original diocese. Yeah. But because of political machinations yeah. uh, and appealing, having the semblance of uh, we're obeying church doctrine yeah. uh, and, and, and an ecumenical council, but in fact it was for ulterior motives. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okie dokie. So we're um, the homily. So that's the the idea of the homily. Now the yeah. Anyway, we could say a whole lot more about that, but I think it's uh, it's enough. The, uh, then after the homily comes the creed. The creed originally was repeated very much in the Diocese of Rome. And in the, I don't know what time the custom started to develop, the, the, the creed is always as a, known as a symbol of the faith. There are several different creeds. There's the Apostles' Creed, developed first in the, or formulated first in the Council of Nicaea, 325 AD. Then the Nicene Creed, or the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, uh, the full mouthful, that's the longer creed that we say on Sundays, and that's in 381 AD, so the First Council of Constantinople. But then there's other creeds. For instance, you see St. Paul in one of his letters, I'm not sure, I think maybe to Timothy, he says, um, uh, if we have uh, died with him, then we shall live with him. If we hold firm with him, then we will remain with him. If we disown him, then he will disown us. We may be unfaithful, but he is always faithful, for he cannot dissolve. Uh, for he cannot, um, uh, he cannot something disown his own self. Well, that to me strikes me as a an early kind of creedal formulator, a nutshell, you might say, not so much about the Father and the Holy Spirit, but about Jesus Christ, who this Christ is. The other creed that is there, attributed to Saint Athanasius, known as the Athanasian Creed. You'll be very grateful that we don't pray this every Sunday. It's about five pages long in small print, but it, it would take, honestly, uh, I think probably about 15 minutes to, to read, if you're just gonna read a slide, but it just goes in and out of the doctrine of the Trinity, and it's always essentially about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, what we believe. Then, it's attributed, I said, to Saint Athanasius. It isn't actually his, it came later on, but there was the custom in those days of attribute, using a pseudonym of someone famous in order to give weight to what you are writing. Just a few comments, though, about the Creed. I, I mentioned already it's about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
in the creed, there are a couple of points that where we, whenever there's the talk about the incarnation, we're meant to bow. So he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. You know, or uh, in the Nicene Creed, we say, and he came down, um, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. What do we say in the Apostles' Creed? Um, I believe in Jesus Christ. Uh, anyway, it's hard to pick it up halfway through. Um, I believe in Jesus Christ. Uh, is that, it sounds like he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, and was and, and then and that. In other words, the Apostles' Creed is only about two verses. We have to bow down. The other one is um, about three verses. But it's meant to be a solemn bow. And again, that's just a point to keep in, take into account because it's often not observed. And again, that's one of the ways in which the church is teaching us the moment of the incarnation should be uh, received with a certain re reverence and so forth. Just like, have you ever wondered why we bow our heads at the name of Jesus, apart from the fact that it's the name of the Savior? Well, Jesus St. Paul says, and every knee shall bow, you know, at the name of Jesus. But can you imagine, you know, every knee shall bow, and then Jesus, and I'm doing, it's a bit hard and impractical <laughs> to bend the knee at the name of Jesus. Unless you're going to say, oh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, so the idea, we bow our heads instead of bowing the knee, instead of genuflecting. That's what it's about. And it's it makes, you know, perfect sense to me in that it's just practical. Liturgy has to be practical. The other point that's worth commenting on the uh, on the creed is he descended into hell. It's often a point of misunderstanding and confusion. But I don't understand how does Jesus descend into hell? I thought he came to crush hell. Why on earth would you descend into hell? What's going on? In the Greek it's, it says um, uh, was it katapthoma or something? It says, he descended to the bottom. In the Latin, it says, inferis, which means he descended below. And, uh, but inferis also sounds close to infernum, which is hell of the damned. In English, the word hell means both the hell of the damned and the place of the dead. That's in the dictionary. So Sheol in the Hebrew, the place of the dead. So where Jesus descended below, it means he descended to the place of the dead, to Sheol, to where Adam and Eve had gone, to where all those who had died before him and had not been catechized. This is what we covered last week when we, you know, between Jesus dying and then rising again, he went to evangelize the dead. And we, in the Liturgy of the Hours, those who um, pray the Divine Office or may want to pray the Divine Office at some stage in the future, the, the reading, the Office of Reading, the second reading from the Easter, Holy Saturday, has a beautiful meditation on what Jesus did between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. He went to evangelize the dead, excuse me, to prepare the good news to them, and prepare them then for the resurrection. And so he opened the gates of heaven through his death, but then revealed the new life through the resurrection. So that's just a clarification. Jesus did not descend to the hell of the damned where Satan and the other demons are. Those are damned. Full stop. Case closed. The jury is in on that one. And... Uh, yeah, but the, the place of the dead. Okay, now, um, that, that's the creed. Then we move to the, uh, okay, Speedy Gonzalez, let's go. Uh, then we move to the um, prayers of the faithful. The prayers of the faithful is always an introduction directed to the people, the first remark. It's not directed to God. Then, the so if you're ever having to write prayers of the faithful, don't say, Dear God, that we come together as your family on this blah, blah, blah Sunday. No. You say, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, my dear friends, my dear people. There's a, it's an introduction to the people. Then the prayers are in these order. They're always an intention. 
It's not, dear Lord, we pray for the church. It's not directed to God. We are for the church, that the church may blah, blah, blah. And the four prayer intentions that we pray for, or five really, is the first one, we always pray for the church, number one. And each of these intentions, by the way, you can have multiple in prayers for. But the first one is always for the church for, and her leaders. Two, for the civic leaders. So we pray for our politicians, we pray for our local leaders, we pray for other people of influence, you know, business leaders and, and so forth. We pray for them because they are influential, they, they have an impact on how our culture is formed. Three, we pray for those who are in any particular kind of need. So the sick, the dying, those who are suffering, the unemployed, the what are underprivileged, the migrants, the uh, whatever, you know, indigenous suffering from whatever. All those intentions fall under that. Those involved in an earthquake, those. Fourth, we pray for ourselves. So you always pray for yourself last. This good manners, you serve others first, then you serve yourself. And then the last one we pray for, just because it refers to the last things, we pray for the dead, those who have died. So the church and her leaders, civic leaders, those in any particular kind of need. And as I said, you can have multiple intentions for each one of these. And then the, you pray for yourself or ourselves, and so the local community. And then uh, we pray for those who have died. Then the final prayer is directed to God, so the presider. And that's then, you know, Eternal Father, blah, blah, blah. We offer you these prayers which we make through Christ our Lord. Amen. <coughs> Things are often made, and the prayers are often ended in the church through Christ our Lord, because Christ is the intercessor for us with the Father. Any questions? That concludes the liturgy of the Word. Now, from now till the end, we have the liturgy of the Eucharist. The liturgy of the Eucharist begins with the preparation of the altar. The altar should be clear before Mass. Even clear of the candles, if it's possible. If you have three standing candles, it's better than the one standing on top. Then it's, uh, and you shouldn't have flowers on the altar either, although you may have flowers, just individual flowers on the edge, like is the Roman custom. The gifts are brought forth, bread and wine and water. Uh, I know often you'll just find bread and wine, but you can actually bring the water because the water, while it's not one of the main gifts, it is always added to the water, to the wine, sorry. The water is added to the wine. And it's there in the early church. Saint Justin Martyr talks about, you know, we bring bread and wine mixed with water, or bread, wine, and water. We bring them up the gifts, the offertory. But other things may be brought forth also during the offertory. And during the offertory, so uh, other goods for the poor. Uh, uh, I don't know. In in the early church, the <clears throat> yeah, they would bring all sorts of things, you know. So chickens, uh, eggs, uh, <laughs> carrots, potatoes, whatever, and, and then the priest would take whatever he needs for himself, and then the rest would be distributed mm -hmm. to the poor. There was also taken up a collection, again, for the poor, widowers, and so forth. And this, again, was ancient custom in the church. So the church from the very beginning was always saw that this is something that they should do and be able to uh, look after the poor in a particular way. Then we, the priest, remember I said to you, we're at the, the different windows of the liturgy or to tell us which part of the mystery we're engaging in. So in the liturgy of the word, we're engaging with the public ministry of Jesus Christ, his preaching and teaching. And the word prepares us then for the sacrament. If we don't recognize the message and the meaning of God in his word, we will never recognize him under the form of a sign. So and as St. Paul tells us, faith comes by hearing. So we must hear and listen attentively in the word. Then we're ready for what's happening after that. We move on then. So the gifts are brought forth and then the priest takes them and prepares them and says the corporal is opened up, the cloth, and then the, the pole, the chalice, the pattern, the steel dish, or an open ciborium, the steel container, which should be made of silver or gold, precious metal, not pottery. And then the, the, the bread wine. Bread may be baked, but it's got to be properly baked if it's going to be baked. 
Um, typically, we take the shortcut and we just have wafers to make it nice and uh, simple. But uh, then the priest takes the prayer, and blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, you know the prayer. It says the same over the wine. At this prayer, this moment, that prayer that he says is virtually exactly the same prayer that the Jewish people would say during the Passover supper. And the Passover, Jesus did the Last Supper in the context of the Passover, but as someone asked in, during one of the breaks, that in fact, the, it wasn't the proper Passover, because the Passover could only be done on Good Friday evening. And Good Friday evening, where was Jesus gonna be? In the tomb. <laughs> and so he did it the night before, and that's why the Gospels give us the, the context of the Last Supper as if in the context of the Passover, but it wasn't actually the Passover. And the animals were to be slaughtered between the two evenings. And uh, so the Passover, so it would be slaughtered on Good Friday. So they would have prepared a lamb. And the apostles would not have understood at that time what on earth Jesus was doing, right? But they did later on because he was the lamb of God that was originally promised to Abraham in the sacrifice of Isaac. God himself will prepare, the, will provide the lamb. During that occasion, he provided a ram, an, an adult male lamb, but now he got the lamb of God, whom St. John pointed out, and is now sacrificed on um, Calvary. So symbolically at that moment, we are at the Last Supper, when we see the priest preparing the bread and wine. And then he begins the opening the, of the preface, and the preface begins with a dialogue between the priest and the people, fine. Then from there it leaves, we, we, the priest leaves the people, so to speak. Now they're drawn into the mystery. The, the priest now begins, he's standing in the person of Christ. He begins his dialogue with the Father in the Holy Spirit. And for the rest of the Eucharistic prayer now, the dialogue is Trinitarian. The priest in the person of Christ talking to his Father by the power of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> He then, the, the sign of the coming down of the Holy Spirit, the extension of the hands, known as the epiclesis. And so that's a symbol that, you know, we're remembering that it's by the power of the Holy Spirit that these gifts are now going to be transformed into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Then the priest takes, says the words of consecration, and this to answer your earlier question. After the conclusion of the words of consecration, the bread and wine have changed into the body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus Christ. Full stop. Christ is completely present there. Body, blood, soul and divinity. Under the form of bread or under the form of wine. Okay? And, the, and that's why then the priest shows us the host. See that although it looks like bread, it's actually the body of Jesus, and then genuflects. In fact, under the extraordinary form of the Roman rite, the priest would genuflect first, and then raises him up, as if he acknowledges him first, and then raises him up, and then now uh, he genuflects again, as if with the people, to adore Jesus Christ. So, the, uh, so that's that part, and then now at that moment, the body and blood of Christ are sacramentally separated, aren't they? On the altar. Yep. When else were they separated before? On the cross. You know, at his death we're told that, you know, the knife was, or the, the blade, the lance was put into his side and there came out blood and water to show that Jesus, his blood was, um, was actually... Uh, He'd shed all his blood, you know, so now it's basically there's not much blood pressure left. So water is coming out as well, all the weeping. And obviously there was still some blood left in him, but the idea that he shed his blood completely for us. So we know at that moment that we are at Calvary. Sacramentally, the liturgy is showing us we're at Calvary there. We've left the Last Supper, we're at Calvary. But we're still in the context of the Eucharistic sacrifice, the, the table of, of sacrifice. And then we go through, there's a period of remembering, and the prayer of the, of the Eucharistic prayer continues, telling us about the wonderful thing God has done, the resurrection, ascension into heaven, and then we come to the end of the Eucharistic prayer, and we 
concluded the prayer of the known as the doxology through him with him in him and this is the only actual proper elevation that we have in the mass the showing of the host and the chalice are not actually elevations they are showing he raises the host and shows it to the people the consecrated host same with the lamb of god towards the end the priest picks up the host over the chalice or over the pattern and says behold the lamb of god then we uh, but that gesture of elevation is the offering of the new sacrifice of the everlasting covenant jesus christ to the father and then the people so the priest can either sing it and then the doxology or say it and the people respond with amen the amen isn't just for the end of the doxology but rather the amen is for all the eucharistic prayer that has started from the preface the lord be with you and with your spirit lift up your hearts that part which then goes to the holy holy we all kneel down we're worshiping god all the millions of angels who are mystically present there worshiping the father as well with us and then all that happens in the in the liturgy in the um, i think the melkite rite after the consecration is when they add the water they bring a jar of hot water to show kind of the the hot or the 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 breath of the spirit and they'll pour some water into the precious blood so you might say well hang on does that affect the precious blood now is it no longer precious blood that's a question that the latin mind would ask but the idea is no it doesn't because it's it doesn't they would have to dilute it beyond quantity for it to cease being the precious blood it's the idea to show the input of the holy spirit to make that blood in fact um, sacred and to make the wine actually blood now just some practical questions here um, although it changes the body and the bread and wine change become the body and blood of jesus they still remain for all our senses bread and wine for our senses that's why saint thomas says the only sense that we can count on and trust on is the sense of hearing our taste deceives us our look deceives us our smell deceives us our um, smell deceives us have i covered them all yeah. yeah anyway but our hearing is the only one why what hearing who's hearing hearing whose word hearing the words of jesus we believe them because he said them full stop but the testimony of scripture sometimes we hear from protestant evangelicals that it's not really the case and there are two main heresies about the eucharist one says that it's not really the body blood soul and divinity of jesus it's actually a mixture of body of christ and bread it's called companation heresy that it's a mixture of bread and a mixture of his body heresy it's not true he is fully fully there and only jesus there's not anything else there except jesus the external what we call the in philosophical terms the accidents the that it remains of bread and wine but the substance what's really holding it up is actually the body and blood of Jesus. So it's completely Jesus there. So heresy number one, the heresy of combination, a, a, com a combination of, of bread and body of Christ, or blood and wine. And then the other heresy is, uh, is transsignification. So that only the significance is what changes. Now, it starts off being bread and wine, but now the significance is gone and become the body and blood of Jesus, but not actually become the body and blood of Jesus. So it's not really present, it's just significance. Which means then, uh, and some, even the Catholic Church, have actually taken this on board and said, oh, so you know, there's no need for reserving the blood sacrament. After Mass, Jesus stops being there. There's no significance, it's outside of the Eucharist. Nonsense heresy dismiss it it is lies the truth is and you see this from st john's gospel chapter 6 but also uh, the, um, the other places in the scriptures you know where st paul says you know we need to discern what we eat and drink otherwise we eat and drink death to us jesus himself when he's gradually 
preparing the people for the gift of his body and blood as his flesh for the life of the world, we reach the point where most of his disciples, in <coughs> fact, when most of his disciples, in fact, do you need a glass of water? Okay, that's right. someone will get you one. The, in fact, to uh, prepare them for that, we're told in chapter 6, verse 66, that most of his disciples stopped following him. Jesus doesn't turn around on the other hand and say, hey guys, you misunderstood me, it's all a mistake. I didn't mean really that it's my body and blood, my flesh and blood. He doesn't. He turns around to St. Peter and the others and says, what about you? Are you going to? Non-negotiable teaching. Just like forgiveness, just like carrying your cross every day, non-negotiable. The Eucharist was a deal breaker. He wasn't going to budge. This is what it's going to be. Like me or lump me. In the early church, though, we find that there was no confusion such as this that developed in the Protestant Reformation because some people who didn't know Christians thought they were cannibals. They eat the body and drink the blood of their, their redeemer, their founder. Can you believe that? Because there was no mistaken about it. The early Christians 